look ahead at the U.S. Department of Transportation under the Biden administration. My guest is David Winstead. He is an attorney with Ballard Spar. Hello, David. Robert, nice to see you. Nice to be with you. Now, David, as you know, we're having this conversation before any of uh, President-elect Biden's nominations are confirmed. But given or assuming that Pete Buttigieg does get confirmed by Congress as the new uh, Department of Transportation secretary, what sense do you get of his ability to run DOT? Well, I think that he's had, I think during the presidential campaign, he had a very aggressive platform of, of transportation initiatives and investment. Uh, obviously, Biden's was uh, more in terms of money. Uh, but uh, And I think their mix is a, a bit different. But there's no question that he, uh, during the campaign, spoke a lot about infrastructure, is very interested in it uh, personally, and has that background that so many DOT secretaries have had. Obviously, under the Obama administration, we had a mayor. And so uh, the ability to really manage a local municipal uh, plan for both capital program and transportation uh, programs is, mm -hmm. is key to understanding need. And I think uh, what he is equipped at is, and Biden's uh, certainly same way, is really focusing on local decision making in terms of projects and programs that USDOT has had historically. And, you know, I think in that regard, uh, you know, a lot of the initiatives that uh, President Biden has talked about in terms of road and bridge investments, $50 billion of need, electric vehicles, obviously high speed rail, the fact that uh, Biden is very committed to Amtrak, uh, looking at transit and looking at pedestrian safety and bike options, multimodal approach to transportation. I think the secretary, um, I think the, the mayor and Secretary Buttigieg will in fact have very similar sort of approaches to what Biden's articulated during the campaign. And yet what a tough job, as you can attest to, as a state uh, Department of Transportation head, so many competing interests. You've got freight, you've got passengers, you've got uh, modes that are often battling with one another. Uh, right. I'm assuming that this is just, you know, comes with the territory, right? I think so. I think that part of the balancing act will be, and obviously Congress has uh, took, took some action uh, recently on the COVID recovery and more money, but clearly one of the biggest urgencies, in my opinion, is the, is the transit realities that you've got a lot of the major uh, national uh, urban transportation rail systems that are have seen huge drops in ridership, which has created a you know 60% reduction in Washington in terms of riders. Huge challenges just coming out of the gate for any new secretary of DOT is really working with APT, American Public Transit Association, understanding that important role of public transit and really trying to help those systems, uh, those municipalities and, and states recover. But even as you do that, you're always going to be faced with that, the, the infrastructure issue, which we have been facing down for decades now. Where do we come up with the money and the wherewithal to engage in a trillion dollar plus initiative to maintain and construct our transportation infrastructure. Do you have any hopes that this time we're going to get it right? Well, I do think that, you know, obviously we've had a, an election that um, has been very bifurcated in terms of, of our experience, uh, but I do feel infrastructure like public buildings were is very much of a you know, common uh, bipartisan need. And I think mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, ASHTO representing really the states that manage and implement federal grants and monies to build and to modernize systems, you know, is looking, is very appreciative of the one-year extension, the $13 billion that they got. But the overall ask of the states through ASHTO is for $37 billion. So you're correct. Right. It's a lot of money. And the reality is that uh, as I said, I think transit recovery and ridership on these huge investments in these transit systems is going to be a real key first focus. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think the integration of sustainable transportation systems, if you, you know, not so much, you know, shovel ready as shovel worthy as a friend of mine commented recently at Ashto, I think that'll come into play and sustainability will be a key part of obviously the Biden agenda. 
There's never been any lack of commitment on the part of public officials for the need for infrastructure improvement in all the areas that you just described. Where it always hangs up, though, is where the money's going to come from. Right. Should we, you know, whether it's an increased fuel tax, national federal high fuel tax, which seems to be heavily opposed by both sides, right. do you think that we'll come up with a solution at some point, whether it's public-private partnerships, whether it's just coming out of the general treasury, whether we do raise taxes? I hate to go down this rabbit hole with you in the few <laughs> minutes we have, but just real quickly, what do you think? Well, Robert, I my frame of reference personally was back... Um, you know, a, a couple of authorization bills ago when I was head of ASHTO, president of ASHTO. And what I felt was necessary and it did succeed is we got the National Governors Association on board for infrastructure. And Governor Hogan just concluded the presidency of the National Governors Association. And his chairman and issue, when he was chairman over the last two years, was infrastructure. So you've got the NGA on board. I think you've got ASHTO on board. I think you've got APT on board. And the real issue is making sure these federal funding formulas are adequately funded, uh, looking, that's number one, looking that the funding flexibility and decision-making is locally based. That is the people on the ground that understand the need and the options, you know, you know, can design programs that will in fact deliver that. And then the other thing is you've suggested, which is absolutely critical, is the role of the private sector in all of this. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, three P P3 projects have had uh, substantial performance and success internationally. And right now, the largest project in the country that's been advanced is here in Maryland with widening the Capitol Beltway and the I-270, creating toll lanes and HOV lanes to fund that needed ca capacity on the highway system. So the P3 private funding is going to be a key part of this. Yeah, a, a quick acronym explanation, ASHTO, American Association of State Highway and Transportation, Transportation Officials, is that yes. correct? Okay, um, I have been seeing lately some editorial comments scattered here and there about suggesting that we bring back earmarks, that uh, individual <laughs> legislators should be allowed to like, you know, assign a certain portion that used to be called pork, but it was also called <laughs> earmarks as a, as a solution to retaining local control of projects. Right. What do you, do you think we may be headed in that direction or, or not? Well, Robert, I don't. Um... You know, that's really for Congress and the politicians to comment on. But I will tell you my personal perspective on that. Um, you know, I think earmarks had a huge role for decades in, in the transportation funding formulas, mm -hmm. largely to gain support, you know, from members of Congress and senators. Uh, but it did, it did often disrupt the locally based decision making that a state has in coming up with its consolidated transportation plan the case of Maryland, looking at highway needs, transit need, airport needs, toll authority needs, and obviously port needs in the case of the Port of Baltimore. And what earmarks do do, I mean, no member of Congress is gonna advance an earmark without consulting with the states. And, and But it does often, um, you know, interpose itself in priority on something else that has worked its way through on a six year capital program. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that if you were to ask, I don't know what Ashto's and I'm not being a current member of Ashto, I don't know what their current thoughts are, but it does, um, the concept of trusting the states and long-term capital program development and allocating, uh, asset, allocating capital to the modes that are needed, both repairing systems, maintaining ridership on transit systems, you know, is a very sophisticated long-term role. When you have, at least my perspective on it, when you had earmarks, you know, you had, something coming in that that could just, you know, just reorder those priorities, which can yeah. be confusing. Yeah. Um, it is generally assumed, and President-elect Biden has specifically stated that there will be a greater emphasis by this incoming administration on the environment right. and environmental protection. That being the case, do you think that that will reorder transportation priorities as opposed to you're talking, you keep talking about public transit as a very important thing. Right. Do you think that the pool of money available to transportation projects in general will be reallocated with that in mind at the expense of perhaps previous, uh, previous uh, directions. You know, I, I do feel that obviously looking at, you know, the role technology plays, electric vehicles, obviously autonomous trucks and cars, looking at the sustainability of projects and the impact that the environment will have, climate change, on fixed assets, public works, 
will take a high higher visibility and higher implementation during, in my opinion, during the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. um, and and clearly that's all backed by the whole effort of trying to, you know, with Secretary Kerry moving up to be a climate czar. I mean, I think there's a, going to be a huge focus on this. Um, I'm sure it'll. I'm sure it will change in terms of some of the uh, niches we send out of DOT that we seen during the Trump administration and different focus, obviously in Biden uh, administration. California standards is a case in point. They're obviously looking at regulatory review of autonomous and you know electric vehicle implementation. Mm -hmm. You know will will change. Uh, but um, you know I do I do feel that the sustainability initiative of the president like Biden, you know, will find its way through the transportation programs. I hope it doesn't supplant critical needs in maintaining infrastructure and developing capacity and driving ridership on transit, but, you know, we'll see. Yeah, and then there's, of course, the competing priorities of urban and rural populations. I imagine a lot of uh, the more rural uh, areas wouldn't, uh, probably don't care about a lot of money going toward, uh, you know, uh, transit systems in urban centers. So once again, another competing priority kind of battle to fight. But so no it question. goes with every day in the transportation department, right? <laughs> it does. I, you know, a reflection point being Maryland, we had a you know, Republican governor elected in a two to one Democratic state for two terms. And what we saw is that he did, in fact, reach out to the more conservative elements of Maryland, Eastern and Western Shore and listen mm -hmm. to them about road repair projects that had been postponed for much longer than they should have because of that huge demand that you have from metropolitan Baltimore and Washington and all the money it requires to maintain those systems. Well, nominee Buttigieg or whoever ends up getting the job of US DOT secretary in the next Biden administration has a lot on his plate as you, David Winstead, well know uh, with your deep experience in this industry. I wanna thank you so much for putting in perspective the issues that the DOT is facing in the years to come. Thank you very much for enlightening us today and for being with me, appreciate it. Thank you, Robert, good to be with you.